when they decided, oh, let's do a barista competition, let's do this kind of competition, we were not even considered in the picture, right? We were right. people who were supposed to just produce coffee and send it away. Mapper Forward business mastermind groups are back for 2024. And if past mastermind groups are anything to go by, you absolutely want to be a part of this if you're a business owner ready for change. Spots are limited to 10 people per group and if you own a business in the coffee sector and are looking for support in a nurturing and focused group coaching environment, this could be the thing that helps you through these challenging times in coffee and jump starts your planning for 2025. There are three mastermind groups, each with a different business focus. I will be your coach and the first one will be focused on strategic business planning, the second one on business growth and the third on increasing your sales in coffee, both B2B and B2C. Groups start the week commencing October 7 and prices start at $189 per month for three months. You get a discount if you pay all three months in advance. Previous participants found these groups life-changing for their business and all groups come with a 100% money-back guarantee. If you're interested in finding out more or registering, head to mapperforward.coffee forward slash group coaching or check the links in the show notes for details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward Friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and this is episode three of a fascinating five-part series with Camilla Khalifi. Uh, Camilla, we are talking about the privilege in coffee. It has been a long, long time since I had uh, conversations like this on the podcast. It's usually about these days about the coffee crisis and supply chain and economics and sea market and blah, blah, blah. So this is a really refreshing conversation. Before we get further into it, I just want to want to remind people um, that since we can no longer have sponsors on this podcast, I would really, really appreciate it if you would share this podcast with your friends to help us get the the word out about the podcast. Uh, support us on Patreon uh, for a couple of dollars. Watch the ads on YouTube uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, or you can become a paid member on YouTube for just a couple of dollars if you are in a privileged position where you can support us to ensure the longevity of this podcast. Um, so, We are having a fascinating conversation, Camilla, and in this episode, we're going to talk about who has the loudest voice in the coffee industry, which is so fucking ironic coming from somebody who's got one of the biggest coffee podcasts in the industry to even have this conversation. Uh, So go ahead. Who has the loudest voice in this industry? Tell us. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I don't know who has the the loudest voice, maybe us. (laughs) Uh, it's also a matter of who has the voice by default, right? right? Uh, one so of what the... do you mean by that? What do you mean by... Please. When I think this conversation got started but by that, you know, when I was saying that we don't need more white guys with mic. Yes. Um, it's not that I am again white people it's not that i am against white guys it's not that people take it personal it's not personal i think it's reflecting on systemic issues okay. you know it's reflecting on who are we learning from uh, in the previous episode i was mentioning that we the way we learn about coffee quality the way we we define, who defined coffee quality, right? Mm -hmm. Who defined what it is, what's an 80, what's an 85, what's an 88, what are the descriptors that are more valuable in coffee Um, and the references that we have, like the people that we are hearing all the time from. I do feel there is a lack of diversity. Um, I don't think it's just me, you know, no, no. it's like if you look at the numbers, it's overwhelmingly uh, uh, white. And so if I understand you correctly, you're saying that even in the businesses and the consuming end, it's more white dominated voices that set the standards that we all adhere to now. 
correct? Everywhere. Yes, everywhere. Who are setting the standards? If you read, like, take any coffee book. Yeah, I, have, I don't know. I have like 30 here. Uh -huh. And if you take and you look at the contributors, it, they're all or 95% from the United States uh, or Europe. Okay. Everyone, like all the knowledge, all the ways of doing things, you know, everything mm -hmm. is set up there in the North. And from a very similar perspective. I do feel there is a lack of diversity in points of view, in it's, it could be such a rich industry, you know, if you, if we listened equally mm -hmm. to all the voices, if we did a, a larger effort to well, begin. I I can say as somebody who puts a lot of effort into making sure that this podcast has so many different voices, this, this is one place mm -hmm. in the industry and I'm so grateful for everybody that listens to this podcast because what it, it tells me is that we are open to hearing that we don't know everything, that we want to hear and consider other voices, that you know, that I hear from people all over the world that tell me, you know, thanks for having this person on because I never considered that opinion. I rarely hear from people say, thank you for having this Indian person on the podcast or for having this white person on the podcast or for having this person from Colombia on the podcast. People don't say that, that listen to this podcast. And there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast. So I'm excited by the fact that this industry is changing. I worry that, and I'm going to get fucking creamed for what I'm about to say. I worry that we tie privilege to race too much. We? I, oh, yeah. You? Me? No, me, me, me. Like, like in general, as a, as a, as a, as a industry, but in the world, actually, I look, I live in Dubai, right? I am shocked by how different cultures, this is the most multicultural city I've ever lived in. And I was born in Australia and I lived in America for a long time. Both of them are very multicultural cities. This is the most multicultural city I've ever lived in. And the coffee industry over here is incredibly multicultural. And I am still trying to sort out my feelings about mm -hmm. the way different races treat each other here, which is very different from how privilege is presented here. Because privilege here doesn't really have that much to do with race. Privilege here happens a lot more on a whole bunch of other factors than race. What about gender? Uh, no, actually, you'd be really surprised. And and I want to make sure that I mention this so that people who have these ideas about, you know, what it's like to come to Dubai and et cetera, you know, women must get treated like shit over here. Women get treated better here than in any other country I've ever lived in. I have never been treated so well as a woman than I do, than I have been in this country. I have experienced next to no sexism here and I am shocked, mm. shocked at it. And all of my girlfriends here say the same thing. I am completely shocked by it. And so as like this place turned my head upside down, I wouldn't tell anybody to come and start a coffee business over here. Uh, unless you have a globally recognized brand, please, folks, like the, all this hype that you're hearing about, come open a business in Dubai. There's all this opportunity in Dubai. There's 26 fucking coffee venues, 26,000 coffee venues in a city that has 3.6 million people. What? Unless you have a globally recognized brand, you've got no business coming here. There are a lot of people here that will convince you, yes, 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 come to Dubai, open your business in Dubai. There is a lot of opportunity for people who have a globally recognized brand. If other than that, no. 
so I hope I don't get kicked out of the country for saying that. But anyway, so um, so it, what it has got ha- got um, me thinking about is this idea: if privilege and race are as not are not as correlated as I thought they were in a city like Dubai. What what is what are we doing in coffee to have? Are, are we intrinsically linking that thing because we have been told to by the media? Because what I think, and this is going to be a little controversial and out left a field, I think where the privilege is coming from is from who has the most marketing dollars. Marketing what? Dollars. Who I think that especially when we're talking about who has the loudest voice in the coffee industry, Whoever has the greatest ability to do the trickery and fuckery that comes with marketing. So whether it's lying to people, whether it's tricking them through advertising, whether it is manipulating different markets, uh, consumers particularly, to say that they should be buying this product or shouldn't be buying that product, whether it's people writing articles that tell lies about co-fermented coffees and infused coffees, all of this is hijacking the actual narrative of what's going on in the industry and using that narrative for your own purpose. That is privilege. That 100%. That privilege, I'm not sure that that's tied to race. I think that that's tied to integrity. And if you are willing to... If you are willing to trick and um, manipulate in order to get your agenda across, now I think you're the one who, not, not obviously not you, but I think that that's the people who are having the loudest voices in this industry. You recently, this is a lot of the stuff that you were alluding to in recent posts, right? Mm-hmm where you were talking about why do specific people get to set? Um, what, I, I don't want to refer to the specific post, um, but you're welcome to, I can't. Um, but you were talking about specific cup scores and things like that. Uh, and you were talking about, you know what I'm talking about. And anyone who so. knows your Instagram knows what the fuck I'm talking about. You can mention it. I can't mention it. Um, but this is where, because someone may have a large Instagram following and if they have a large Instagram following, they're now signal signaling to a market and saying to them, you shouldn't like infused coffees or you shouldn't like coffees that are, uh, doing X, Y, and Z, or you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when people are building these communities so that they can build it, I call them cults. You're building a cult so that you can have people who do what you want them to do and then you have the largest voice in the industry. And this is everything I stand against because what you're doing is taking the microphone and making your agenda the most important agenda in the room so that you can sell more shit to people who don't need it. Yeah. Um, I think what you're saying is completely accurate. Um, In the consumer-facing side, Mm -hmm. I feel there are a lot of uh, coffee influencers, let's say, Mm -hmm. that use their mic to mm, perpetuate, let's say, um, messages that uh, continue to center uh, the attention on 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 the north. On like, let's say if you are talking a lot of uh, me coming from the quality from the quality side of coffee, I mm-hmm. feel that. Uh, when we are talking about specialty coffee in general, we are looking for high quality everywhere, right? From the coffee and then in, 
we get into the discussion if cold fermented is high quality or low quality? Is mm -hmm. it valid or not valid? So then we go to the next step. What is like a, a good roast versus a bad roast? We get to a good brewing device or a good grinder versus a shitty grinder. Mm -hmm. So we are all the time looking for top quality. And we are all the time looking at this duality, right? So it's good versus bad. So mm -hmm. I feel when these people grab the microphone and say, this is good, they are automatically saying everything outside it is bad you know it's inherently bad and okay we are like missing the chance of having a, a range a spectrum of a spectrum of everything and we are it, it's very the cult i i i couldn't agree more with that term because i feel we are as an industry very dogmatic you know it's like this is good this is bad this is yes this is no like everyone is and, and the amount of people that get affected by that, by that way of thinking and communicating is huge, you know, because more often than not, the vast majority of coffee people fall into the outsider, you know, right. the coffee that is below 88, coffee that is uh, whatever, you know, <laughs> right? like e everything that you, um, so, um, Going back to what you were saying about privilege tied to race, I think that historically it has been like, you know, since the colonial era, the privilege and the power stayed on one side. Um, I love to see that there are places where it's not so tied. I love to see there is, there are so many layers and there's so much diversity, like in, in mm -hmm. micro climates in coffee. Mm -hmm. And I, I love listening to you and, and knowing that many times we assume when I, what I was saying before, we assume that Dubai is like this. We assume, you know, <laughs> like women are treated like this in Dubai. We yeah. don't know. We don't ask. We don't even ask yeah. because we just assume. So, um, but I, but I see, and I think you you have to see what's going on around you. So if I'm involved in competitions, for example, mm -hmm. I see, I see there are no black judges. How many black competitors do you see at national level or at the world's level? You know, how many people of different colors, of different backgrounds, of different, it's, so it's not, when I talk about the diversity here, I do see it's an industry that prides itself mm -hmm. for being diverse, but doesn't necessarily set the environment for diversity. So, oh yeah. Like you look at it even here. Okay. So I'll give you some insight into coffee competitions here. Shout out to anyone from the UAE coffee community that's listening to this. There's a very significant partition. Here, you call an Emirati a local, okay? And the coffee community is very young here. And I don't mean in age. The whole country is 52 years old, right? Okay. The coffee industry has been going for maybe five to seven years. So like full steam five to seven years. So you look at the coffee competitions here. And there is a split, a significant split between three main groups of people, the locals, the African community, and the Filipino community, right? And there is severe competitiveness between those three communities. And I could tell you stories of how people are talking about cheating and talking about how the Filipinos make sure that their people get into the finals and they make sure that the Africans don't get in by making sure that they end up on the same blah, 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 right? It, it is wild, wild what goes on here 
But then you remember the same shit goes on in America and the same shit goes on in Colombia and the same shit goes on in every country where these competitions exist. And so people sit there and they say to me, Lee, coffee competitions are important because they create community, but you all fucking hate each other. What kind of community is this creating when you're all competing against each other? And there's all these layers of, for lack of a better term, racism and divisiveness that's happening because somebody wants an Emirati to win or they don't want an African person to win or they don't want this person to win. And now what we're doing is instead of creating an environment where people can actually come together and learn from each other and prop each other up and actually succeed, the thing that they're not understanding is the majority of anyone that's going to win in this competition is not going to be able to go to the the world uh, title in America, because no one's going to give them a fucking visa to get there. Yes, exactly. Uh, many times I think about uh, not only competition, competitions and coffee events and coffee uh, opportunities in general. Uh-huh. I feel they were uh, invented and they were created in a world where we didn't count. I, Who's we? We people from the global south, we people from producing communities, we people who are not in the traditionally consuming country. Okay? Mm-hmm. And so when they decided, oh, let's do a barista competition, let's do this kind of competition, we were not even considered in the picture, right? We were right. people who were supposed to just produce coffee and send it away. And when I started in coffee, and it was not long ago, it was hard as a Latina to build relationships, to get in that world. And the environment is not inviting for diversity. You don't feel welcome. And I I feel that's changing, definitely changing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to make sure I contribute to Mm -hmm. that change. but I, when I, when I look at them, I'm like, of course, they were not designed for, for us. So they are different in English. They take place in, in countries where we don't get visas to. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they require expensive equipment. You know, it's like all the conditions are easily met in Europe, easily met in the United, United States. And now that we are part of the picture, because the world is changing and we started going to SEA Expo and we started to, people started building more relationships and mm-hmm. they, they do not evolve to make them more welcoming to the, all the diversity of people that can participate in. So it's like, we are always catching up and trying to play the game with those rules that were not made for us, you know, as a judge, as a volunteer, as a competitor, as a competitor, it's like. And again, what I would say is, and I'm sorry if people are going to hate that I say this, don't prop up these organizations that are not welcoming you by going to their events and volunteering your time and doing all of this stuff. If the SCA can't get their shit together, and make this inviting for the, all the people that want to be a part of it, why are we support, supporting these competitions? These competitions are a moneymaker for these people, for these organizations. And they require your participation in order for it to go ahead. If we don't participate, Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say, and I believe this, I believe that they did not set out to create a competition that was exclusionary. But by default, it got exclusionary Mm -hmm. because there hasn't been a champion from Saudi Arabia that I believe was able to compete in in the world competition. Or from 100%, the guy from Iran, the, the, the recent winners from, none of them have been able to go to any of these competitions. And yet... Iran continues to run these competitions. Iran, Why? please don't, no. don't kill me. But- no, but the thing is, because there is a 
outside of competitions that does the job, you know, we still want to be part of them. And that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like if I continue my path as a judge, as a rep, as a, it's because I do feel we deserve to be part of the right. table, you know, to have our seat on the table and to change things with our perspective. It, it, I, I don't, I don't know if they will get the message if we don't go in and tell them. But they will get the message if you decide not to participate. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. If, <laughs> I if, think they will be fine. I th No, I think that when they see that people are deciding and use their voice, if we're talking about who's got the loudest voice in the industry – let me tell you, the people who have the loudest voice in the industry are the ones who control the narrative of which what direction the commodity and the money flows. If you're the person who's handing over your money, you are in a position of privilege. Equally, though, if you're somebody who's handing over coffee, you are in a position of power. You may not know how to use that power, but that doesn't mean that you're not in a position of power. And it may be very, very, very difficult to say no, but you are in a position of power. More than any time, we are now in a position of power if you're a coffee producer because supply and demand economics and the C price are definitely showing you how much power you have and your ability to turn around and say, no, you didn't treat me well when I had loads of coffee that needed to be sold. Now I get to pick and choose who I get to sell this coffee to. But that same power needs to be something that when you're in this moment where you can make all of this money to then be able to turn around and say, how am I going to make my situation better when the price goes back down again so that I'm not in a situation where I'm desperate to sell. And learning how to do that is a position of privilege. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't go and learn how to figure that out. Yeah, it's again, it's like the, the it's boundary a dysfunctional, setting. Right. It's the boundary setting. But the thing is, like, I feel like all the time in coffee, there are like systemic issues and individuals are, you know, meeting and overlapping and it's hard to differentiate and when one can solve the other. Yep. Or in, in, an, in a, put it, to put it in a different way, it's like many times we expect individuals to change systemic issues with individual choices and i don't know if that's going to to happen you know no right but a barista if... a barista a barista not competing in a national competition is not going to change how the sda does no things. however if colombia turns around and says or if if latin america turns around and says we're not going to participate in these competitions anymore. We're going to run our own competition and we're not going to in any way contribute anything to the other competitions that are happening. We're running it on our own. That is going to make a difference. The thing uh, or the problem I see with that is that it's some sort of break breakage I don't know we need like I feel it's it's easier somehow it's easier at the moment to break you know to say right. okay we're cutting but then we have relationships and we still want to have relationships and we need relationships mm -hmm. and it's not about like no it's like we are going to be in our own uh, environment because how are we going to fund them how are we going to <laughs> You know, and so I don't, I, I think it's again, responsibility of, I, I love that we are part of the picture now, but I also think that side has to catch up with making it a more welcoming environment. I agree diversity. with you. And for people from different backgrounds. And I do feel there is, there is an effort that we don't. It, it doesn't go at the rhythm we would like, right? It's like we 100%. would love that next year all the competitions to happen in the global south. That is not going to happen. Or but... in Dubai. Everybody can get a visa to Dubai. Why isn't Ooh, the world competition? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. The, the UAE is very welcoming. 
Why don't they hold the World Barista Competition in Dubai? Is it welcoming for everyone, though? It is, it is welcoming welcome- for trans people? Is I have friends for- who are trans that live here. Is it? I have friends. Listen, and this it- is a very conservative culture, right? So, and, and by conservative, what I mean is um, even between a hetero couple, public displays of affection are not a part of this culture, right? It's just something, it doesn't matter what culture you come from, public displays of affection are just not something that happens here, right? No, the Latinos are fucked there. No, but- I think we should have them here. I, I think, hey, it doesn't, it's not all going to happen in one year. I agree. We should happen. It should happen somewhere in, in the global like, south. That, that's the point. It should the, it happen. It should go everywhere. It, they should be scattered more. Yeah. It like should, the, because if they have them here, like trans people, what, so help me understand something now that we're doing this, right? I did not know the conversation was going to go in this direction, but what, what does what is a trans person expecting to come here and do that they think is going to get them into trouble? I don't think I can answer that question. I, of course, like that would be putting that would be shutting their voices down. Right. And okay. Th- the, I, I, yeah. But for, to say that a trans person would not be welcome here. In order for us to answer that question or to make that statement, you'd have to understand what a trans person is coming to disrupt here if they feel that they wouldn't be welcome here. Because as I said, I have friends who are trans here. So there are trans people who live here. There are friends of mine, gay couples that live here. The like... It's not like everyone's like, yes, come do the LGBTQI like pride parade here. That's not a part of, but you wouldn't be, we don't celebrate Valentine's Day here either, right? Like it's not, we, we don't do public displays of affection. Maybe we do celebrate Valentine's Day. But yeah, but you all know. these, but the thing is, like, and did it completely out of the <laughs> we, we, we went there. We right. went there rabbit hole but anyway I, I think if if anyone anyone no matter who they are can't be their full selves anywhere that is not okay you know and if you can't be fully Latina and if you can't be whatever that means I am not here to to define what Right. Uh, what each of these uh, definitions are. Right. But I do feel that many times, in, in, and, and to go back, we set an environment that is friendly for ones and not the others. And we don't stop and think, is everyone going to feel comfortable here? Is everyone going to feel welcome? Is everyone going to feel like asking questions, like raising their hand, like letting us know if something is not right. Mm-hmm. It could be easy when I, I, many times I have people saying like, no, it's okay. It's like, they were so nice to me. Like, yeah, maybe because English, English is your first language, for example. Okay. So you felt comfortable and okay. Did I feel yeah. the same? Is everyone feeling the same? So I do feel like if we pride ourselves for being a welcoming and diverse industry we every one of us and with more privilege more responsibility for this is to set environments where everyone feels as welcome as comfortable as entitled to speak you know and not building courage to raise your hand and to have your voice heard you know and i i agree with 99 percent of what you just said right i love the idea that that may be a world that we live in the part of it i don't agree with is that i believe that it is everybody's responsibility to cultivate the courage to be able to use their voice this is a life tool right 
and and some people need help learning how to do that and that to me is the idea of privilege when you feel that you can use your voice because you were taught how to use your voice this is when it doesn't have anything to do with race for me this is 100%. the gateway if you came from a family where you you were seen and you were heard it has nothing to do with your race 100% yeah. right and so yeah. it behooves you to whomever you are in whatever room you walk into for you to start figuring out how to cultivate the life skill of being heard and using your voice because particularly for women this was not something that was allowed for a very long time and i can tell you as an arab woman raised by an arab woman and an arab father this was not something that um is a life skill that i was taught mm -hmm. And this sets us up perfectly for the next episode because we're going to be talking about the role that women are playing in the coffee supply chain. Because the voice of women, particularly when you look at places like Origin and women's ability, particularly because they're better cuppers, no disrespect to the men, it's a scientific fact, women can taste coffee, can have better senses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if they're the ones who are determining the cup quality at Origin, but their voices are not being heard as much throughout that process, well, we are really doing women a disservice. So join us for the next episode, folks. Peace, love, and peanut butter. Have an amazing rest of your day. I really hope you enjoyed this episode, friends. Please don't forget to show us some love by subscribing, liking, commenting, and most of all, sharing this podcast with your friends. Check the show notes for links, including our sponsors and our Patreon. And stay tuned for more great conversations on the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward.